My name is Susana Ramirez. I am the executive director of High Tech, and I'm from Costa Rica, so pura vida. As we do that, I just want to let everybody know that today's session is going to be recorded. We do this very intentionally, and I'll let you know why. The information that you're receiving here today are going to be golden nuggets, stepping stones in the foundation of building your wealth of knowledge. We have a repository at High Tech on our YouTube channel of all of these high tech sessions. You'll receive a link also to this session that feel free to share with the rest of your community, share the knowledge that we have here. And you will also receive at the end of this it, within the chat a survey. Your feedback is super important to us. It's important for us in planning our next sessions, and it's important to us to hear from you what it is you want to hear about. That is how we literally got to this session. We got to this session because overwhelmingly we heard from our community the need to know more about Gen AI. So we went to one of our most prestigious partners, the partners that lead in the front in this effort, and we asked them to help us in this in bringing the subject matter to life to you. So with that said, I am going to hand it off to my friend, a esteemed Jorge Coral, High Tech 100 winner, one of our pillars within this community who always raises his hand, who's always on point to help lead these types of efforts. Jorge. Thank you, Susana. Thank you for the really, really kind introduction. It's always great uh, to work with you and Omar and the High Tech crew. Uh, I'm Jorge Coral uh, with Accenture. I live in Dallas. I'm from California. My parents are Mexicanos, and I'm happy to join you today. Uh, first, I want to thank High Tech and the High Tech leadership team for all that they do in organizing this discussion and for providing Accenture to facilitate the discussion. Um, and thanks to all of you who are in the audience uh, who are taking the time to join today. I think we had well over 200 people register and joining now, uh, and we'll get more uh, listening to the recording later. So uh, welcome to the conversation. Thank you all. Uh, I think you'll enjoy today's uh, conversation. I know that you will, and I'm excited for it too. Um, so let me get started by sharing with you kind of the run of show, what we're going to cover today, the for format wise. So we're going to start off with an introduction. I'll introduce you and we'll have, I should say, we'll have the, the panel. We have an, assembled a panel of distinguished Accenture AI experts. I'll have them um, pr uh, provide an introduction. They're going to bring a diverse perspective to this conversation on how AI and Gen AI data are impacting different industries, different businesses, capabilities, functions, and how we're seeing uh, the market really change really quickly. Uh, we'll move to a brief primer on Gen AI, just to ground everybody. Um, and we know that many of you have some experience, different levels of experience with Gen AI. We've all heard about it for the last year. Uh, so we'll keep it brief, but we want to level set everyone. Um, and along the way, define terms, uh, concepts, et cetera. Uh, then we'll transition to an open conversation and q and A with the panel. We'll cover different topics um, that we think we'll think will resonate with a lot of you and really deep dive on how businesses are applying AI to reinvent uh, their businesses while managing risks and uh, enabling their workforce to, to do uh, bigger and better things. Um, and we've also set aside some time at the end for open Q&A, because we imagine as we're going through this, uh, all of you are gonna have some uh, questions uh, that, that uh, we'll, we'll hope to answer as many as we can. By the end of it, we'll, I'll ask that uh, just put them in the chat as we go. So as, as things come, pop up, if you have questions, Put them in the chat. We'll organize them and try to answer as many as we can at the end of the call. And then we'll uh, we'll we'll hand it back to uh, to Susana and Omar for uh, for uh, for the wrap up. So so with that, let me start. Let's start off with introductions. Uh, as I shared, I'm Jorge Corral. Uh, for those who don't know me yet, uh, I lead Accenture's data and AI practice for our South Market unit. And for those uh, in Dallas, you may know me because I've uh, I also lead Accenture's business in North Texas. Uh, and as Susana mentioned, I've been involved with high tech. For many many years uh, and i was a high tech 100 way back when in 2018 time flies so let me hand it over to uh, to carrie carrie maybe you could give a, a brief introduction happy to do that i want, want to take susanna on in terms of doing the high tech welcome as well so carrie smith i am the global lead at accenture of our data and ai um, business group and um, i'm from jamaica so what a guan and that means <laughs> what's up how is everyone doing and then um, my background, uh, I'm, I've been from the entrepreneurial world. So I've been a founding member of several fintechs, all within the data AI emerging tech space. Spent a lot of my time within financial services. So with 
banking, wealth managers, asset managers, um, and also I spent time um, uh, supporting private equity clients and also some work within life sciences. I, I've been with Accenture for about four years now and have had the opportunity to play a variety of roles, including our strategy and consulting financial services work, uh, but really uh, focused in on right now our data and AI business um, uh, with our global banking clients and very energized about the space. I'm looking forward to the conversation uh, today. Great. Uh, Tracy, how about you? Wonderful. I'll join Susana as, as well and say buenas tardes. Uh, I, uh, Tracy Ring, I am our global lead for life sciences for generative AI, and I also have the honor of being our chief data officer. Um, very excited uh, to be joining you. I spend, again, most of my time uh, working across med, med tech, life sciences, biopharma, and the distribution system there, um, but I, I live in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, prior to that, I, I um, you know, worked at a different firm and I actually had the honor of, of living in Mexico City for three years. Um, so very, very excited uh, to be with you this afternoon. Awesome. Thank you, Tracy, for joining. Sumit. Hey, folks. Sumit Mahajan. I'm based out of Chicago. Um, I run Accenture Center for Advanced AI, which is an umbrella term for uh, all our AI capabilities, our Gen AI studios that we've set up. Um, and, and, and a very advanced research team, and hopefully some of that I can I can share with you today. Um, uh, I grew I was born and raised in India, and as you know, India is a is a melting pot of many many different uh, um, cultures, right? So the the two that I'll pick today would be Namaste and Salam. Awesome, thank you, Smee. Hey, so I think uh, as promised, I thought we'd start off with kind of a primer on Gen AI uh, to ground everybody. Sumit, so maybe we could start off. Uh, with you talking about maybe the evolution of Gen AI and the technologies yeah. we're seeing, and maybe bring to life some of the different things we're doing in our centers, et cetera, uh, around Gen AI. Yeah, absolutely, Jorge. So um, um, I, I get, as you can imagine, I get asked that question quite, quite, a, quite a bit, right? And the the audience is always sort of very diverse, right? Uh, both in terms of age group and 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 their backgrounds, right? So I usually give a very simple technical answer and a very simple non-technical answer. So so let me share both of those with you. So the simple technical answer is think in terms of concentric circles, right? If the outermost concentric circle is a circle of AI, a field that some of you might know, some of you might not know, but has been around for 75 years roughly, right? Uh, and the the early onset of AI was here are my business rules. Hey, computer, go follow these business rules and do something with it, right? So that is still AI, but that broad outermost circle is a circle of AI. This next circle within is a subfield of AI called machine learning. It came into prominence around 1990. And the best way to think about it is, instead of me telling the machine what the rules should be, the machine learns what the rules should be and then applies it, right? Of course, it means I have to give it data for it to, to learn those rules, right? But around, 2000s and so 2010, another circle emerged within machine learning, and this circle is the circle of deep learning. And it said, machine learning, you are great, but you're not good at learning unstructured data. So how about instead of learning using general machine learning languages, you start mimicking how the human brain works, how the neural network works, right? So, so that's sort of the, the deep learning circle. Now we have AI circle, within that the machine learning circle, and within that the deep learning circle, right? And then one fine day, someone very smart said, can I use those deep learning models and apply it to all the available data that's out there to create, instead of creating a purpose specific model, I'm gonna create a generalized model that the whole world can use at scale. That is what generative AI is, right? So the innermost circle, AI, ML, deep learning, and, 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 and Gen AI. Right, um, and because they are trained on these these generalized corpus of data, you can use it for multiple purposes as opposed to using it for one task only. Right, so that's the that's a simple technical answer. But the but the simple non technical answer is um, I like to think that for the very first time in history, computers can read. Right, and I don't mean the literal art of reading, but also reading and comprehending, and then using that knowledge for other purposes. Right, computers have always been great at scaling stuff better than humans, right? Doing things at at at, at a faster scale. Uh, but for the very first time in history, they can truly read and continue to use the knowledge for multiple things, right? So there is a, a very famous children's author. He, he passed away recently. Uh, his name is Tommy DePaula. 
He wrote about 250, 260 odd books for kids. And he said, quote, reading is important because if you can read, you can learn anything about everything and everything about anything, right? So that's that power that generative AI has brought to computers now. But now imagine this, if you have two entities, a human and a machine, so right, on one side you have a human and the other side you have a machine, both know how to read, both know how to learn, right? So the human can generate the seed of an idea, but the computer can now generate multiple similar ideas at scale for the human. The human can set the direction, but the computer can bring the speed to get to the end state of the direction. The human is the pilot and the computer is the co-pilot. So for I'm sure as we go through today's discussion, we talk a lot about these co-pilots, what do they even mean, right? But but hopefully this sets a stage for a simple explanation, technical and non-technical, of what Gen AI is and, and why we use the word co-pilots. Yeah. Hey, Sumit, can I what I think of is uh, we hear a lot about chat GPT. Can mm -hmm. you kind of give that in the context of the other? Because we also hear about other foundation models. That's a great, 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 great question. Yeah. So I think um chatbots are in fact a great way to explain that pivot in technology, right? So all the chatbots that existed before this whole chat GPT explosion, and all of us as end consumers have interacted with some chatbot either over the phone or direct on the on the laptops with our telecom companies or with, with our Amazon or other retailers, right? Um, now those responses were always predefined structured responses, right? So there was this complex decision tree that was behind the scenes and you asked a question and if the question led to a predefined answer, you would get an answer or you will get gibberish, or you would get transferred to a human, hopefully, right? Now, the, the evolution in the case of chatbots that has happened is instead of providing predefined business rules, you can still provide guardrails, but within that, the computer can learn the context of the retail industry, can learn the context of the telecom industry, can learn the context of the services that you offer, can learn the context of you as a consumer, what do you want, and have a very fluid conversation with you that is not pre-medicated based on some predefined business rules, right? So which is why if I go to chat GPT right now, I can have a very natural language-based interaction with them, but also because it has been trained on a huge corpus of data, I can tell it draw a dragon playing basketball, even though that particular computer has never seen a dragon in life and perhaps I've never played a basketball game, but it has read books, it has seen images, it has watched videos of something similar, right? So that's the power um, that that computers have today. Awesome, thank you. Sure. Uh, really interesting. So um, uh, I was thinking, Tracy and Carrie, I know you guys are coming on the heels of having developed a lot of the content for what we just presented at uh, the World Economic Forum at Davos. Um, a lot of really different, interesting use cases, demos, et cetera. So maybe uh, we could start with you, Tracy, and you could just share some of the different things you're seeing in in business in general, in technology, et cetera, uh, where you see it evolving. Yeah, it's a super question. Uh, is it relates to how we think of the industry agenda around this? And, and I think this is extremely important because, you know, we started this journey, as Sumit mentioned, you know, almost 14, 16 months ago, right? And so, um, you know, people have been playing around and doing some cute things in chat gpt many organizations have their internal version of uh a large language model whether it's anthropic or or, or a chat gpt that's inside their firewall and they're safely interacting with but the pivot has really been how do we take the things that are true business levers so for me i work in life sciences we're thinking about deeply influencing and disrupting this idea that to bring a new therapeutic to market that it should take 13 years and over $2 billion, right? So, so completely upsetting that whole idea and all the different ways from the way that we discover all the candidates for, for drugs, the ways that we're checking for toxicity, the way that we're moving them all the way successfully through clinical trials, whether that's creating synthetic patients, whether that is creating better communications to ensure that patients are coming in to get their checkups and get successfully through, whether it's making a more sustainable supply chain, right? And applying some traditional AI, IoT, and generative AI 
And then everything as it relates to commercializing. So whether you're thinking about true commercials that you would see on television, or whether we're thinking about communicating to healthcare providers in ways that are really fully curated, impacting the entire life cycle of that journey. And so I'm focused mostly on that early discovery phase, which we think is the most impactful because if we can solve for that, the whole rest of the molecule to market, as we say, really starts to collapse and you start to see some incredible con um, compression. But I think most importantly, we're working and trying to help organizations take these small scaled POCs and either abandon them because they are not cost effective and don't deliver on the value or rapidly scale them. And the last bit I would say is that we're working on this idea of a continuum, right? Unlike old technology where we would implement, let's say SAP, and I, I say set it or forget it, you know, and, and just do keep the lights on and bug fixes, et cetera. All of this is, is anchored into this idea that we're continuing to monitor, continuing to stay responsible. All of these aspects of how we're thinking about using it to sort of influence and create much more of a community around it. So, so these very, very, very deep um, industry specific solutions is how you know we're, we're thinking about solving. And, and I would encourage you to, to think about your own organization how how there's there's nuances, right? Because the way that Carrie's going to talk about this is very very different than how I think about it in life sciences. And so, Carrie, I, I should hand it to you before I bore everyone <laughs> with life sciences too much. No, it's very interesting um, stuff. But I, I I agree with what Tracy is saying. I think some of the the industry specific nuances are are, are uh, interesting to see. There's a commonality of pattern, but definitely some things which are unique um, as you start to think about the industry specific. So, um, as I mentioned in my intro, I you know work a lot within financial services, uh, working with with banks as well. So if I think Jorge and everyone here, the evolution that has happened since I think about January 2023, and then where we are right now, February 2024. Um, significant um, maturation, I would say, um, just in terms of people um, and corporations embracing uh, this technology. So I would say uh, conversations that we were having with clients um, maybe in early um, parts of 2023, um, there was definitely a lot of, of skepticism around it um, regarding um, is this going to be kind of the next flash in the pan of a technology? Is it going to be something that actually is sustainable? Does it last? A couple months later, um, people were seeing, okay, there is something here. And how do we actually start to think about, particularly in financial services, also within healthcare, right? Highly regulated spaces. So how do we think about risk management, the controls, the guardrails around that? Um, but what I would say around it as well is that, you know, and in, within Accenture, we talk about really encouraging people to bring their full self to work. Um, and I think that happens in other corporations as well. So people are leveraging chat GPT, right, in their personal lives and seeing all the wonder of what it can do and you don't turn off that persona when you come into the office, right? So there's a lot of en engagement and passion also to see how do we apply it to the different work areas. So if I think about how things have moved, what, what most financial services organizations started with was internal facing applications, right? So looking at how are people looking at knowledge management? How are they searching for policy documents? In many in organizations, these were items that were noisy. Why can't I find what I'm looking for, right? How do I actually get to that? So being able to apply um, generative AI in those areas was some way for them to be able to, one, address something that was a dissatisfier around the employee base, a safe area to experiment, but actually a way to get the organizational culture around what truly is this technology and what can it do. That quickly advanced to other areas of the enterprise. So starting to look at some of the operations, the contact center, right? How are we, our developers working with technology? Um, how are we driving optimization there? Because sizable productivity improvements with what Sumit is talking about. This is my AI co-pilot, my AI buddy. How is it helping me to accelerate some of the areas? Where we are right now in uh, February 2024 is really applications across the entire enterprise within a bank, right? So thinking about your front office, meaning the relationship managers, your tellers, um, how are how you're thinking about marketing to operations, to technology, et cetera. And because of that widespread enterprise level piece, what we see with organizations right now is they're really grappling with this thing is actually really transformative. It's across the entire enterprise. I need to find a way to think beyond my initial POCs and experimentation to how to think about this in a more holistic level. So really around how do I get to that enterprise level value? And that is requiring then 
a more uh, kind of methodological look in terms of how do I think about the implications for talent, the upskilling that's required, right? New roles that are going to be created because of this technology. How do I think about managing this responsibly? How do I think about value and what the impact is, right? Because as I mentioned, there's a lot of passion, a lot of excitement there, a lot of opportunities to apply generative AI across the enterprise, but money does not grow on trees, right? They're finite dollars. So there also has to be prioritization. So how to think about the business case. So if I think about where we are today, Jorge, to answer your question, I would say a lot more now people understanding this um, ca capability, this technology actually has transformative value. We're already seeing examples in production. We're able to see the value of that. How do I actually think about what this means now across talent, across all of these areas and come up with more of a holistic strategy so that I can actually tap into the true power and actually successfully scale. And that's what we're seeing a lot with banking now and more of the demand on that side. Thank you, that's really interesting. Uh, you know, one of the things I think about, what's fascinating to me is what, you know, what does this look like in a year? Because things have moved so fast in just one year. Yes. And now, as you got, you all talk about proof of concepts moving to scalable solutions, et cetera, that's, that's super interesting. Any thoughts on life sciences or banking where like if you thought a year from now, two years from now, what like as a customer, what would that look like? What what do you see as like something that's going to change? I think I, I might start with a, a provocative perspective that, that I think almost everything is going to change. I'm I'm working with one of my clients who they are having meetings actually today um and, and their entire executive leadership team is doing training on generative AI and how they think about completely transforming every single aspect of their business. And so I I know that you know we know statistically um, from you know studies around our census that 60% of jobs that are in existence today were not in existence 40 years ago, right? So I'm I'm extremely bullish on the idea that of course there was not a global head of generative AI or a chief data officer or anything like that, but I think that the new transformation that we're seeing and the new opportunities, I think will not look anything uh, like this. I, I joke many times that I get um, clients will say, I, I'll give you a ton of notice. We'd like you to come speak for us in 90 days. And I immediately say, thank you very much. I wish you would have not said that because now it means we're gonna have to rewrite the presentation four times. Things are literally moving that fast and examples and proof of concepts that we did last fall that we said the ROI isn't here, this is too expensive, this doesn't make sense. We're coming back and revisiting and saying the technology is changing in such a way that there's new ways. So things that were taking uh, you know, $100 million are now taking $10 million. Things that are taking 10 million are going down to a million, right? And so we're, we're seeing, you know, the, the, um, the, the broader revolution occurring both on the technical background, like Sumit discussed, as well as the adoption that we're seeing is changing everything as it relates to business process and as well as the back end. And yeah, I think I agree with what Tracy is saying. And then also adding to that, I would, I would look at, um, I feel like there's a, there's an energizing side that comes with this um, emerging technology as well. And one of the things that we look at is, how do we take um, waste out and put value in? So I think as, as we look at different roles and, and, and areas that people are working on right now, I mean, there are some parts of the, 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 the task that we probably maybe don't like to do, <laughs> right? Um, or maybe wondering, um, why are we doing this? And we, we see that a lot as we look across um, processes within, within banking corporations as well. Some, some things may have been workarounds that were done because of something that happened five, 10 years ago, but it's still part of the business processing today. So as we're working with client organizations, there's definitely an energy around coming to say, okay, where are we today? What's that baseline? But if we were to think about the day in the life in the future, what actually is our vision of where we want that to be? And, and for people to actually be able to kind of, in some ways, come with a clean slate and actually design what's there and, and, and allowing and leveraging the technology to help with some of that optimization. So if I think about it, Jorge, with a lot of the productivity improvements that's there, it's freeing up a lot of intellectual capacity that I would say was actually done on things which were not necessarily higher value added. 
So I think there's a bit of wonder in this space as well, which is as we bring that amount of creative energy to the space, what can it actually mean, right? And so from a client experience perspective and all of that, I think there's going to be a lot more creativity as well in terms of thinking through what may be new product offerings, right? And how does that customer experience look? And how do we actually co-create and design using the multimodality of the technology as well, right? We can get text, we can get image, we can do that. So how do we have more customer agency, right? In terms of designing what their banking experience should look like, what the product experience should look like, but also from an employee perspective, right? A lot of the time that I may be spending on my spreadsheets or doing some of this stuff, and no, no offense if you love spreadsheets, you can maybe do higher value added on that too, but it's more than how do I actually think through what may be new aspects of the job that I were not was not able to do beforehand. So as we looked at some of that, we've actually done some math on it as well to say, as we think about some of that productivity that's going to be freed up, what does it mean, right, in terms of my frontline and what I'm able to do in terms of new product and the revenue growth, but also from an optimization perspective? And then what does it create in terms of net new jobs, as I mentioned as well? So if I think about it, Jorge, for the future, I, th I always say that the future is bright. Um, and I think the way I look at it is embrace the technology, uh, work with it. There's a lot that's available there. And let's kind of redesign, right, and think through um, reinvent what the future would look like. Yeah, let me, let me just 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 take a slight tangent and add that not only Jorge, Susana, uh, Omar, and myself, but everybody on the call. I think we're very lucky to have Tracy and Kay. I think it's a it's 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 a coincidence in a very good way that we are represented by two industries where one industry, the upstream R&D is just so important. And then another industry where the downstream customer interaction is also important. And at the bookends of those two industries, you can take any other industry and slot them in between, right? So, so today's discussion, you know, I'm sure uh, the, the high-tech community on the call is from a diverse set of industries, but, but let's not, not take advantage of Eddie and Tracy being on the call, right? Regardless of the industry, I'm pretty sure we can we can answer questions. So I encourage everybody to 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 ask uh, questions. In, in in terms of your your question on what's gonna how different the world will be in a year from now, right? As a technologist, my job is always to see beyond one year, what's the next five year and ten year, right? And and to Tracy's point, it's just moving so quickly that we can't wrap a man our head around it, right? Uh, I think Bill Gates said it that as as humans, we underestimate. We overestimate what we can do in, in a year and we underestimate what we can do in 10 years, right? And Jenea is a very good example, right? That nobody expected this to come up and boom, all of a sudden things are just crazy, right? It's an important point to note because as we focus on Gen AI, we have to think about the other adjacent technologies that will make it faster, better. And one example that comes to mind is quantum computing. All of us in the call perhaps think quantum computing is, is at least like 50 years away, right? But what if? even a fraction of quantum computing becomes available in the next 10 years, all the goodness that we're talking about and all the concerns that we're talking about risk and everything is gonna be 50,000 times at scale, right? So, so I think it's, it's important to start adopting the technologies right away, whether it is tech A or tech B or tech C, just so that we have some common ground answers for, for the next tech. Uh, when it comes to the next one year, I think the biggest change that I see think we will see, and, and Jorge, you and I grew up in the supply chain space, so maybe you will relate to this more. So supply chain, as an example, is a lot about supply planning and demand planning and procurement, right? So Gen AI, you can use it today to transform each of these functions individually. I can have a demand planning agent. I can have a supply planning agent. I can have a procurement agent. But in a year, we will be talking about a multi-agent system where it won't be me telling it to optimize supply or to optimize demand. No, multi-agents will be talking to each other to solve an enterprise-wide goal. And while that might seem far-fetched, trust me, you'll, you'll start seeing some multi-agent examples, hopefully in banking and life sciences in a year from now. It's really interesting. So um, Sumit, I was thinking about, um, we, because we talk a lot about Gen AI, uh, Maybe maybe bring it together on the data side too, because it's a spectrum: data, AI, Gen AI. Maybe talk a little about what we're seeing in the market on on how companies are overcoming that challenge too, because data has always been a challenge for companies. It's still always, is. always. Uh, I'll start with the first big mindset shift that I'm seeing. Uh, September 19th or 20th last year, we had about 30 CXOs come to uh, one of our studios. This 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 one was in Chicago. 
and it was a mix of CEOs, CFOs, and CIOs, right? Uh, I shouldn't say just CIO, you had CIO and, and chief data officers as well. And we had put them in two separate rooms to talk about different topics. It was interesting because the, the business side of the C-suite was talking about, why is my data not ready? And the, the tech side of the house was talking about, I've been telling these guys to get the data ready for five years, but they don't just give me funding. Right. So, so when when people started to walk out of those sessions, uh, it seemed like finally data has risen to a very high priority list. To when it's not that people have not been asking to to get the data ready. It's just that it never was in the top five, right? But now it has it has become to to that point because if you go back to my earlier explanation of of Gen AI, the models that are available off the shelf they are trained on generalized knowledge. If I truly have to use it as Kerry was explaining or as Tracy was explaining into my business in my context, chances are that I need my own data to make those models better. Otherwise, what is the competitive differentiation between me and my competitor? They both have the same models and the same underlying data, right? So that's the urgency why data readiness has become top of mind, right? The other thing that makes it a little more complex is we're not just talking about structured data now. We're talking about all sorts of unstructured data, all the 98% dark data that none of us ever cared about before. But now, like, how do I get it in, in the right place, right? Uh, but it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, the, the bright side is while the urgency of getting data ready is driven by the urgency to capitalize on Gen AI, Gen AI is also part of the answer to accelerate the data transformation. So a lot of the use cases, regardless of which industry you represent, a lot of the use cases of Gen AI is actually in faster data, man, uh, master data management, uh, in getting your data transformation projects completed, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's one of those rare cases where Gen AI itself is both the sides of the same coin. Also, we see one exciting thing for those of you that may be thinking, while my organization still has dirty data or it's not well documented or anything along these lines. I think there's an amazing story of hope here, which is Gen AI is actually better in many cases, not all, right? Because we're thinking about early research and patient data, et cetera, it's, it's, it needs to be infinitesimally perfect. But many, many instances where somewhat, somewhat dirty data is actually okay. And so if you've not already started your data journey, this is the perfect time to really like catch up and, and leverage this to your advantage because I think it's a great way to, um, you know, overcome some of the the perfection misnomers that we've always had to deal with. Can we uh, maybe switch gears or talk about something? So, um, a couple of you have mentioned, which is around risk, because we hear a lot about the potential for deep fake fraud, security risks et cetera, and many others. Um, maybe maybe uh, Tracy, Carrie, Sumit, maybe you could share a little about uh, the point of view on risk, on how we're managing, helping clients manage risk. Sure, I, maybe I can start on, on that. And I actually will link some of that to the, the data point actually that we were talking about recently. Um, just now, so if I if I think about um, again going to financial services again, highly regulated uh, uh, industry, and this is applicable to a lot of the highly regulated industries, I would say that there is has already been a really strong muscle of how is it that you do data management, how do you do responsible AI, um, and obviously a lot of work working with regulators to explain how did you make the decision, why did you decide person X could get the loan and person Y could not, right? Um, so there's there is building on a muscle of a lot of that rigor as well on those practices. So what we're seeing um, with some of the work that we're doing now is because of those processes, those policies, that data management rigor there, um, there's some acceleration that we've seen on the financial services and banking side. And you see some of the public examples as well, that there was a, quite a few that were coming from FS. And it was because some of these foundational elements critical for generative AI was already kind of in play. Having said that, there's additive that is needed as you're looking at the large language models. And a key part of that is um, around the data portion of it, right? So there's the general purpose and the insights that you can get from the LLM. But then as you're looking to make sure that the model is giving the right outcome and how to manage that, you want to make sure that you're tightly managing the data set so that you can understand, okay, you made this decision, why? And you can actually have confidence scores and things like that that the models are able to show you. 
and also pointing to what the data sources were, right? So that data management, critical, critical part to be able to manage the risk around it and actually have confidence around the outcome. Having said that, always need to have the human in the loop, right? To be able to do that active monitoring around the capabilities. So um, those, those are some um, areas of it. I think to your point about the deep fakes and, and broader pieces there, we do a lot of work with regulators as well. And so there's then kind of thinking through how do you provide proactive utilities, right? To be able to help then your member companies and firms to be able to then think through um, education of the end consumer as well, right? Because I think some of it is then how do you are with, with as I mentioned before, the multimodality of it. We've seen some examples, right? Where you have impersonation of your financial advisor, right? Because you can actually have the voice, you can have the image as well. So how is it that we actually then train the end consumer so that they have actually more tools in their toolkit to be able to identify, okay, I can see, you know, the 10 things that I typically knew to watch for. Now I need to watch for 20 things. So you're putting some power within that end consumer. And we see many other financial services organizations also doing, giving back to community in that way, right? And, and providing some of the educational protocol. But I think some of that is also coming through um, regulation as well. So if I think about it, Jorge, I, I do say education is a key part of it. Data is a key part of it as well as then building on the muscle of what was done in many of these highly regulated industries as well with your data management, how you're doing your decisioning, how you're doing your policy and keeping that human in the loop. Thank you. Um, I have a question. I'll lead the witness a little bit, Sumit, on this one. <laughs> is, um, uh, we have a lot of folks on this call uh, within high tech who are in industry. They work for businesses and there's a lot they also work with technology. They they work at technology companies, software platforms, etc. So maybe share a little about what you're seeing in the center um, on the all how, on how uh, Gen AI is being included or um, included in a lot of the new software development. Oh, great, great, great question. Um, so I I grew up as a data scientist, right? So more on the intersection of okay, how do I understand the business problem and and convert it into you know. A mathematical problem and then convert the mathematical solution back into a business solution, right? Uh, that's a long way to say that I did not pay a lot of attention while growing up to what was happening behind the scenes in terms of architectures and tech investments and SAPs and ERPs and whatnot, right? Uh, but over the past six to 12 months, the one area that I, I've been spending a lot of time to get myself upskilled is actually in the area where you, you mentioned because that place has been, we, we, we keep talking, we keep hearing the word tech dead, tech dead. We've been hearing for like 10 years and we probably hear it for the next 20 years, right? Um, and tech dead just didn't happen, right? The 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 investments have always lagged behind what was needed, right? Um, but now what I've, what I've learned is the whole area of tech delivery lifecycle, as we call it, TD, TDLC or STLC, right? is one of the top three use cases across industries where Gen AI can be applied, right? So what, what, one is obviously marketing transformation. Uh, there, are, there are some big opportunities in contact center uh, transformation, but the third big opportunity is tech delivery lifecycle. Doesn't matter what industry you're from, doesn't matter if you're trying to install a new system or remove a new system and Convert it into sort of the 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 the, the modern version of whatever you know our, our IBM frameworks were from 30, 40 years ago. Um, and the thing that I learned was through AI, through machine learning, over the past 20 years, if you think about the STLC cycle, the TDLC cycle, enough investments have already been made to the second half of those life cycles. So uh, creating uh, Automation for code testing, as an example, right? Enough, enough, or enough investments have been put in that, but not enough investments had been put in the first half of TDLCs or SDLCs. And by the first half, I mean sitting down with with functional users and business users and understanding what problem are they trying to solve by buying a new technology or investing into technology, converting those functional requirements into uh, technical requirements, converting those technical requirements into sprint plans, converting the sprint plans into designs and architecture diagrams, and then building the code and then testing the code. This entire first half is actually where 60 or 70% of the effort goes. And now using Gen AI, 
a lot of them can be automated. It's never going to be hundred percent accurate, right? But uh, but this is one of the areas that Accenture is very excited about. I am personally very excited about because it's a, it's a learning opportunity. But I'm very sure that most of the CIOs or teams that roll up to CIOs or CTOs, this is the area that they should be watching out for because it's not going to be next year or 10 years from now. Like technology is already ready today to transform your, your uh, IT, IT house. Meet, I might offer one other um lens. Of, of course, I also cover med tech in my role. And one of the things that we're seeing is that because everything we're seeing is AI embedded, right? Every major software vendor has AI inside now and we're using it and we're asking our clients to deeply connect with their technical partners, to connect with their platform providers, connect with their broader technology, because the most important thing, Carrie mentioned, this is extremely expensive stuff, right? It's a customer intimacy opportunity for, for organizations to share where they're innovating so that I don't innovate into something that will be part of their future life cycle, their product mm -hmm. pipeline, their offerings, right? Because that's not how you're going to win in somewhere that's commoditized. You're going to win in the differentiation. And so I think it's absolutely the most bold opportunity to chart your technological path. What are you going to embed AI? How are you going to differentiate? And it's, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. And clients are picking up the phone to hear and learn more than ever. I, I, I had hundreds upon hundreds of conversations last year that started with, tell me about Gen AI. And, and, and I'm seeing our, our clients do the exact same thing. So, so in, in the past where someone might have been an AWS or a Google or a, you know, they're all in on a certain yeah. technology, all of a sudden it's all open again, right? So they're saying, okay, we're going to think about this in a new, fresh way. Who's really going to help us win here? And so I think it's an exceptional time for tech. Great point. Yeah, if I can just add to what Tracy is saying, because I, I love that point, uh, Tracy. I, I think if I if I think about it also as more uh, companies are maturing in terms of embracing the technology, um, there's kind of table stakes, what table stakes is has actually raised. And we are having more conversations like what Tracy is saying now, which is how do I think about this as a differentiator and what's really my disruptive play? So we do have some of our uh, leading financial services organizations actually really placing bets on a handful of what are they going to be their targeted scale plays and where they're looking at it as differentiation. And again, to the point about data, that's a key input into that and where people are having competitive advantages. But I, I think a maturity with that as well, which is yes, we need to apply this across the enterprise, get the productivity, but there are a couple of areas where we want to actually hone in on where we think this, this can help us with some competitive advantage. All right, thank you. Let's. Um, I think we covered the topic on in in, but I wanted to make sure that we uh, covered it for sure. And that is um, talent and workforce. So we we I think we're moving past. Maybe you guys agree or disagree, uh, where people are actually seeing this as human plus machine versus machines taking over all the jobs. Uh, but what's your point of view? What are you seeing? What are you discussing with your clients? Maybe that's a little bit of a loaded question. So forgive me for that. But I think. But uh, I'm curious. Yeah. I, maybe I, I jump in. I, I would say that um, I, I know I talked about some of that organizational passion and positivity with people kind of also doing some of the experimentation in their personal lives. And then also with what they're seeing in terms of the the power of the capability and what it can do. So there's a lot of the organizations have a, a sizable backlog, right, of use cases that are there that people want to address. Having said that, Jorge, I don't think we are over AI is going to take over um, my job. There is still definitely um, some of that sentiment there. And so there is a bit of a view, and we're working also a lot with um, chief uh, HR officers, et cetera, which is as we think about particularly the fast moving pace of this particular capability, how is it that we actually manage um, an organization that we are able to tap into that power? But what is the cultural mindset, right, that's needed there um, for us to be able to move at this pace, right, and, and bring um, folks along and for people not to feel threatened by this, right? So I think there's a lot of, training, change management, upskilling that's needed, transparency in terms of conversation, um, but also with some of the stats that were shared by Tracy earlier too. If we think about the evolution of this, right? Um, AI has been around since the 50s, 1950s, um, as well as then I would say, we've seen a lot of the science, science fiction movies as well. So there's always been this thing that the machines will take over and 
we need to be realistic. They've been beating us for some time, but we're still very relevant as human beings, right? And we'll continue to be re very relevant. So one of the things I talk about with um with my clients as well is just dance through the fear, right? Like we 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 shouldn't sit on the sidelines. There's a lot of great things, AI for good. There's a lot can be done with this technology and anyone can learn anything. So how do we create that culture where people feel that one, they have a right to be at the table. Um, this is not something that's a rarefied area only for specialized people, right? Um, everyone can actually learn this. And how do we bring that AI literacy quotient up across the board within companies? So I think there's a heavy level of education, change management, um, transparency there. Um, but also I would say, um, Jorge, yeah, a lot of opportunity, but still sometimes a little bit of that uh, fear that's there and protection of the jobs. And because of that also, it, it, maybe I would say it limits somewhat the power of what the technology could be doing because people see what's there, but maybe don't want to be as open, right? With how maybe it applies to my area because is it something that's going to threaten my job security? So a bit of a balance there and how to, to be able to drive that forward effectively. Thank you. Okay, I think we're going to move to, we have some questions in the chat. Um, we'll go through them and if we run out, I'll, I have a few other questions I can ask. Uh, but let's move to one. I'll just pick one here, uh, and it's a very specific question. And it, uh, I find it really interesting with all the things that are going on. So given all the models available, any pointers on how organizations can choose the right model? Yeah, there is, there, there is, well, I shouldn't say there's never going to be, but as of today, there is no one size fits all for, for the models, right? So, so it, is, it is a great question. Uh, not only because there is no one size fits all, but also because of how expensive some of these models can become uh, to use and to and to maintain. Uh, and also the thing that Kerry was just talking about, right? How do we how do we think about the right human in the loop, which means some of the outputs from the models needs to be explainable. So there's a lot that you need to think about when 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 you want to think about should I go with large language model one versus large language model fifty. Right, uh, so it does come down to uh, smart architectures. Um, there are patterns that are now emerging uh, where you 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 start hearing the word this model garden. Uh, if you haven't already, you you start to hear that uh, very very soon, right? But but a model garden is typically how and where you keep your curated models, but you don't necessarily use them. I you don't necessarily put a bill against them. Right, but the architecture that you've built is in such a generalized way that you can very quickly test out for your use case one for versus use case fifty, which model performs better. Now the performance KPI still needs to be defined by you. Right? Are you looking for accuracy? Are you looking for cost? Are you looking for accuracy and cost, or are you looking for latency? Right? If this is for Kerry in her industry and it is about front office interacting with customers, then speed is very important, right? They can't wait for five minutes for the response to come back. But maybe on Tracy's upstream R&D side, uh, a data scientist, uh, sorry, uh, a, a clinician, uh, Tracy, hopefully I'm using the word correctly, but, 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 an, but an r and research guru perhaps can wait for 30 seconds or a minute to get the most accurate answer of what DNA combinations work best for X, Y, and Z type of uh, research that they're trying to solve for, right? So, so the, the, the short answer is there is no, there is no button tray that tells you this model works better and that model does not, but there are patterns emerging, architecture patterns, where you can generalize or abstract the actual compute layer behind which sits this model garden that you've curated and based on the KPIs that you decide, you can score which models work better in, in your POCs and your MVP before pushing a particular flower, i.e. model, into production. Yeah, I think that's a great answer, Sumit. And I would say, like, you know, as we look at banking as well with the multiple use cases that are there, there is definitely, I mean, I would say there's a lot more of discussion now with how do you actually think about, like what Sumit said, this, the model garden. But what is that ecosystem, right? Like, I think there's, kind of very uh, many, many new entrants coming in also uh, within the space. And so we're looking at for a particular use case, a particular pattern there, what's the most cost effective and right choice for that? And how do you actually curate then what your um, architectural blueprint would be within the models around what's there? But I would say another part around that would be just also monitoring as you, you see the, many of the new entrants there, 
what is their maturity also? How long have they been in market? What do they have around that? So there's some questions also as you're thinking through um, your ecosystem partner choices and what's there because there's there's still obviously a lot of nascency in market. And so you need to watch that. There may be some things that you do early experimentation with, but you're not actually going to take that particular model yet into production on, until there's a bit more of a time window. So these are some other considerations to look at it. But I would say that I find it actually extremely encouraging. And as we look at some of the emerging technology and the broader landscape there, usually you find that the cost the cost curve usually bends downwards. And we're starting to see that already, right? So I, I do think that things are going to be less cost prohibitive as well and a lot more optionality in the market, which I think is just refreshing. I think, I think it's, it's, it's good to also share with the team here that there, there used to be a time where, where companies would try to marry to just one cloud vendor, right? And we are seeing an increasing amount of customers that are becoming comfortable with hybrid provider solutions, right? So you might be a Microsoft shop today, but within six months, you could be Microsoft and AWS. So Microsoft is responsible on one side and AWS is responsible more for your Gen AI slash AI side. And you might have some of these non-Microsoft, AWS and, and Googles, uh, some of these long tail LLM specific companies that are also part of your garden, right? So, so if you are one big mag shop, don't let that limit your thinking around that's the only partner I need to work with, right? There are there are options beyond that. Yeah, can we double click on that for a second? There's a question here that says, how can organizations uh, gain comfort on the resiliency of the models that they decide to use? And I think what I, when I hear that question, I think it's um, reflecting on all the, whether it's AWS or Azure or Google Cloud or all the other ones that you mentioned, yeah. and there's many emerging every day. I, how when when companies pick, how do they feel good about that they pick the right model? I'll, I'll go back to something that Tracy shared earlier, right? She said that uh, if if someone gives her a ninety day notice, she has to revise her deck like four times or three times, right? And I think that's the thing that all of us have to be comfortable with. If you decide on a particular model today, there is no guarantee that in ninety days from now, that model is still the best model out there. Right? So which is why you do want to think about, you, you don't want to think less about the model and more about what's the business problem that you're trying to solve, right? So if the, based on the data points that you have today on how the model performs on X, Y, Z parameters, and if it if it helps you solve your business case, then that is still the right model even after 90 days, as long as it's still solving the business problem. Now, a better solution might be out there and you can take it as tech debt to, to solve it whenever it bubbles up the priority list. Right, but I would say uh, if as long as the model is still hitting your business case, uh, your model is still good, even if there's a a faster runner or sprinter out there. Tracy, Kerry, would you agree? Yeah, I would definitely agree. I mean, we're definitely seeing the emergence of smaller models um, being a, a a very significant move here. So we're seeing they're you know fit for purpose, they're cheaper. Right. So we're seeing that. And, and I think just to meet's point, the agility around this, you know, we talk about this idea of like a switchboard architecture or a model garden, meaning that, you know, I might need to change. Right. And, and, and I'm seeing organizations run two models in parallel. Right. They're always planning if they need to take an intervention. Worst case scenario, should something go astray. Right. So so this this idea of being much more resilient. And and having a you know a different approach again this is the opposite of set it and forget it it's it's imperative that you're measuring your models and that you're constantly monitoring them and that you're constantly thinking about all the broader implications around this and 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 continuing to inform that again we, we're on a continuum here this is this is a a very different lens than the way that we're going to be there and, and I think even to the point I would argue that there isn't the best model right there, there's always going to be um, you know, the idea that, that that there is a right model and that you're going to go through extensive evaluation period to determine what is the right one, I think is a misnomer. I think it's more about getting in and start adop adopting it, driving um, some transparency around this um, and, and knowing that you may need to swap models. I think that's an, an unequivocal assumption that you have to consider. All right, I'm going to just read a statement that somebody did uh, put in here, which I, I which uh, resonates with me, and then we'll wrap up and hand it over to you, Omar, for the for the wrap up because I think we're almost out of time. Um, and it's from it's from Ivan. The reason some models work better for some use cases than others 
could it be could it be related with both the data that it was used to train those models and the model itself? So I think we would agree with that, right? That data influences influences yeah. that. Thanks for posting that, Ivan. So with that, thank you all for the time. We went through it really quickly because the time flies when you're having a really active conversation. So Tracy, Carrie, Sumit, thank you for uh, for uh, for joint for joining in. A great discussion. Thank you for sharing all of your insights. Uh, Susana, Omar, thank you for having us. And I'm going to hand it over to you, Omar, for the the wrap up. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Jorge, let me let me start by thanking you and echoing your appreciation for Sumit, Carrie, and Tracy. This has been a phenomenal conversation. I have at least a couple of pages of notes here, um, and I know that uh, that our audience has thoroughly enjoyed today's session. Um, Susanna and and Royleen, you know, might uh, might get upset at me for this, but um, I would love to invite you all back for a follow up conversation because I think this topic is so important. And I bet you, if we were to come back ninety days from now, we can talk <laughs> about all of the things that have changed that we that that we predicted would change. Um, you know, as we look at things in ninety day increments. So hopefully, we're able to schedule something. Um, at some point to kind of revisit the topic and see, you know, what 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 things have been working and how things have been changing. I want to ask everybody on the call, and, and we still have 55 people on, I'm going to put in the chat right now a short survey. Literally, like if it takes you 15 seconds to complete, uh, that's, that's too long. It's three quick questions. Um, we've been doing these surveys uh, as a way to just kind of see what you think about the topic, see what you want to hear more of. Did you learn anything? Um, how do we continue to improve these high tech live sessions? Um, so the link is in the is in the chat. Really, really quick. Three seconds, five seconds, three quick questions. Uh, we would appreciate your feedback. So with that, uh, thank you to uh, Accenture for leading this incredible conversation. And Sue, I'll pass it over to you for any final thoughts or words. I just have to echo Omar's sentiments and really thank you to all of the subject matter experts who joined us today. Sumi, Carrie, Tracy, and especially Jorge, you continuously you know, build into our community day after day, and we're very grateful to have you. But this also, I need to do a special shout out to the behind the scenes Accenture team that also makes this happen. Carolina, Ijita, if I'm missing somebody, sorry, my 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 eyes are done today. But um, just very much thank you. Uh, we are a familia and we build into one another. I say that over and over again. So if you have some subject matter experts or you are a subject matter expert yourself, please feel free to reach out to us. We are building out our speakers bureau. We are building out the content that we're providing to our membership and want to have you included in there. So mil gracias. Please stay tuned for our uh, email bl email blast that we'll send out for our next uh, high tech live, which is exploring a AI in the travel industry with um, some of our partners over Expedia. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank Have you a great one. Hasta luego. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Hasta luego. Gracias. Gracias. Hasta luego. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs>